We have now reached the panel session segment of this event. Um, I'll be introducing the panelists and the moderator, and then I'll be inviting them on the stage. Let's start with the moderator, Paul Zeminski. Paul Zeminski, CFA, is a leading global diamond industry analyst based in the New York City metro area, specializing in global diamond supply demand fundamentals and the companies operating within the industry. His research and analysis on the diamond industry, which includes natural as well as man-made diamonds, is used by financial institutions, management consulting firms, <coughs> private and public corporations, governments and intergovernmental organizations and universities. Paul is a regular contributor to industry-leading trade journals, and he's often interviewed and quoted by prominent media outlets, and he's often invited to speak at institutional investor and industry conferences around the world. He has given keynote presentations on diamond industry in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Let's have a huge round of applause for Paul. The next panelist, um, she's unfortunately not able to join us today, but we'd like to give her a shout out, Ms. Shweta Jan. She's the designer and president of Goshwara. Our next panelist is Mr. Amish Shah. He is the president of ALTR Created Diamonds, the undisputed creator of Labron Diamond Marketplace. It is the only vertical integrated diamond house growing, manufacturing, designing, and cutting with world's finest artisans to create the purest form of diamonds known to man. Amish has been committed to advancing the future of jewelry through technological innovations, consumer and jeweler education, environmental initiatives, and utilizing the top industry artisans. ALTR Created Diamonds also manufactures its own jewelry and presents it to consumers through a global retail presence that spans worldwide. Armed with 52 patents on its award-winning cuts, it transforms aspirational luxury into attainable luxury with bigger, more brilliant diamonds of unparalleled quality. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Amisha. Our next panelist is Mr. Anup Shah. He is the CEO of With Clarity, and he drives the company's mission and vision, day-to-day -day execution, and Cree growth initiatives. He is third-generation industry professional with over 10 years' experience in the industry. Prior to With Clarity, Anup began his career in equities trading at Fidelity Investments, specializing in global portfolio trading with algorithms. He transitioned to the diamond industry, learning how to cut, polish, grade, and price diamonds at Demexon Kurtilal Kalidas. Anup is passionate about using technology to create a more transparent jewelry buying experience for today's modern conscious consumer. With Clarity's jewelry shopping experience features unique designs, a free at-home try-on, and an industry-leading lab-grown and natural diamond offering for modern conscious consumers. He holds a GD from Gemological Institute of America and a BS from Bobson College graduating with honors. Let's have a warm welcome for Anup Shah. Also, I would like to invite on the stage two more panelists who will be joining us who are your honorees for the day, Sandeep Shah and Teja Shah. Please join us on the panel. Well, Paul, the floor is all yours. Great. Well, um, thank you very much. What a fantastic event. Um, it, it's, it's such a privilege to be part of this. Um, so we have a fantastic panel. It, it's, we're going to have a nice conversation here. It's going to be on maybe a more, more micro, micro level than we've been talking about uh, 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 you know, prior to this. So we're going to get into um, Lab Diamonds. We're going to talk about supply chain transparency and diamond uh, providence. Oh, okay, sure, great. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about um, branding at a, at a product level and how that's an, an area of the industry is going to continue to grow. Um, so I think with, with LabGrown, just to maybe briefly set the stage and then we'll get into the panel to, to save as much time for that as possible. Um, but it's, it's been a, a very interesting year for LabGrown. I mean, Signet, uh, I, I think, um, as Jenna said, is, is quote-unquote leaning into LabGrown this year for the first time. 
of We've Seen Pandora, the largest fashion jeweler in the world, just launched a Lab Diamond jewelry line uh, in the U.S. just within the last few months. We've seen production capacity uh, expand you know, quite rapidly in, in the last few years, especially in India. India is probably on pace to be the largest producer of, of lab grown, we'll see. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking at, you know, the supply chain transparency initiatives, this is an area that, you know, continues to be very important for the industry. I think it's important because it, it, it kind of distinguishes and segregates natural diamond from lab diamond. Um, I, I think it's, you know, the, 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 the initiatives have been accelerated this year with the sanction on Russian diamonds. So that continues to be a, a more and more important part of where this industry is going. And then lastly, branding, you know, at a product level, at a jewelry level, um, at, a, at a diamond level even, um, this continues to be probably the fastest growing uh, segment uh, of, of the market. Um, and customers want, you know, a product that they can associate with. They want a product that they feel is loyal and a product that, um, that they could associate with. And I think that's going to continue to be you know, a very, very important part of, of this industry. So we're going to focus on those three topics. If we have time, maybe we'll talk about um, uh, maybe what, uh, what, what the future could look like for, for demand is just a, if we're looking at the larger diamond and jewelry industry, um, you know, post-2022, uh, given the economic turbulence, maybe we can get into that as well. Um, but maybe to start with you, Amish, um, we were chatting before the event, and I think he uh, has been out for 20 hours straight. He took a, a red-eye flight to get here in time. So we'll start with you before you fall asleep. <laughs> um, but, you know, looking at lab grown, so you're focused, you know, exclusively on lab grown. You're very passionate. You know, we've talked for hours about this. Um, you're in it for the long run. Uh, and maybe just to start, could you kind of give uh, maybe your opinion of, of, of where the industry's come uh, the last, you know, three, four, five years, where we're going, um, and, and just kind of how you see the, the product category playing out longer term? Sure. Thank you, Paul. I think when we look at the lab-grown category, you know, the journey, when I look at it, uh, that started almost in 2005, 2006, you know, when we entered the category in 2006, it's almost the first people even talking about it. What's humorous today is when I look back, people were laughing. I still remember my first JCK when we had HBHD grown, almost orange, pinkish diamonds, one carat to two carats. And coming from a family that's in jewelry, we actually didn't even go to the market trying to show diamonds. We had fine jewelry and actually labeled, put a collection together to have most people in the industry almost laugh at it. You know, when you fast forward 10 years after that, between 2008, when most people had to slow down, and we went back in 2011, and the journey between 10 and 15 was the evolution of the MPC video, the CVD diamonds that most people talk about. Uh, between 12 and 14 is when you see the first batch of white lab-grown diamonds uh, starting to you know, grow. And it was the earlier what most of us talk as tinges and that, but nothing had come to the market. Uh, I remember in 16, when we brought Alter to the market and we opened the conversation, the level of skepticism hesitation and resistance was still at its peak. Um, the category was looking for a conversation. And I think the one advice I'd got from a strategic team that was helping me was talk to the consumer. Don't talk to the trade. Ask the consumer what is their choice. And I think when we look, Paul, from 16 to 22, what was interesting is between 16 to 17, was the first initial conversation. And I will always thank Borsheim's uh, for giving me, I had a call eight days after we went to JCK and asked me to put a six feet footprint when we're barely trying to tell everybody the story or what the future is gonna look like. Uh, between 16 and 18 were the early adopters, um, entrepreneurs, retailers who wanted to say, you know what, we'll take the chance. Um, in 18, the Federal Trade Commission's final guideline really broke the, uh, the floodgate. Uh, retail store sales went up because I think the biggest thing that happened was consumer confidence multiplied at that time. And I always see the, you know, when we talk about the consumer, you know, we have ownerships here, uh, retailers. I think it's that salesman behind the counter. And what this did was the confidence of that salesman went up. 
it was not us educating because our whole thought process in the beginning, and we've trained about 1,800 salespeople in person in US, Australia, and many countries. The conversation was educate your consumer and let them make a choice. And this journey from 16 to 18 was the opening. Uh, of course, I think I always thank De Beers for bringing Lightbox to the category because that was the acknowledgement of the existence of the category and the future of this industry. So I know many of us who were there were like, oh my God, what happened? And I remember that morning, I'm like, this is the best news that is going to accelerate this faster than what we had projected. If you look at it from a numbers perspective, the Morgan Stanley and Citibank numbers that were put out in 2050 for $150 million were broken already by then. So almost a category that was less than $10 million at retail in 2016 is today at over $5 billion. 18 to 19, the period, and I think 18 to 19, the category started tipping. Uh, you had the big stalwarts, the retailers already starting to look into it. And the 19 to 20, the COVID period, almost multiplied this. Uh, today, the categories cross the chasm point, which is usually when it becomes permanent. This is here to stay. And I think I would always say that in any technological innovation, the consumer is the most powerful person in the room. And this is as an industry coming in. Uh, I grew up in a diamond jewelry family whereby I had the opportunity to leave the business, go do my masters, and my grandfather said, you were born in this business, you're going to be in this business. And I think when I came across the technology in 2005, it was like a kid in a candy store. I think looking at the future of this category, um, it's a consumer that's gonna decide. Uh, when we look at between where we are to just even the next three years, I think the category is finally going to find its own way out. And I know there's this conversation every day about mind and lab, mind and lab. I think it's time to start seeing this as two independent categories in one big industry that's going to stand on its own feet and design desirability and communication along with branding is going to determine its future. So I think you're the stats guy. You have always done numbers, yeah. and I adore. But I think in the next three years, you have $3 billion on the table for everybody to grab. And I think after that, you're just going to see that further multiply. All right. Well, let's add on that. I think everybody would love to hear what uh, Tejas uh, has to think about this. You're the largest uh, importer of, of jewelry into the US. The US is the largest market for lab grown. Overwhelmingly, it's probably over three quarters of lab grown diamond jewelry demand is in the US. Um, like Amish was saying, the product went from maybe 0% market share in 2016. It's now approaching 10% of total global diamond jewelry demand. So how do you kind of see this work into your business? Yeah, so I agree with most of what Amish says. And uh, I think it's 10% of global demand, but it's all coming to the US. So it's really 20% of US, right? And I think this has happened in probably quick 24 months. Uh, I think the first 10 years were, were kind of a soft start. Uh, and we don't see it stopping with any of our retailers. We, we see this in the next three years probably being 35% of the trade. So. so maybe to add on that, how much overlap do you see? I mean, do you see this new brand new incremental demand for lab grown diamond jewelry or do you see it taking, how much of it is taking market share from natural yeah. in your opinion? So, there's, this absolutely cannibalization. A uh, woman has one pair of <coughs> earrings and one year, right? So uh, you'll get some to shop a little bit more and buy a little bit more, but uh, you're going to take from the natural space for sure. And Sandy, I think we briefly talked about this. Um, you know, you, you, you have uh, natural diamonds is, is kind of the, the business that you're, you're most passionate for, but you, you know, are in the lab diamond business as well. How do you kind of see, I guess, positioning this product? Customers want it. There's, a, you know, certainly a certain, um, you know, portion of the customer base that wants this product. So, you know, as, as being a, a diamond jewelry distributor, you kind of have to carry the product to a certain ex extent. So how do you kind of, uh, I, I guess, manage that within your business? Just want to mentioned two great points, uh, one about let the consumer decide, one is don't disparage or you know don't say one is better than the other, let the consumer decide what they want because I go back to the first wrap-up conference, uh, I don't know when it was when 
Terry Berman at that time, the CEO of Signet, said that, you know, I support it as long as it's, it's done with full disclosure. The best part about the American retail is that every single stakeholder is offering a choice in the most transparent way. And the consumer, as Amish said, is deciding it. And this is the first year, so as we all know, we carry both products. And it's slowly becoming a very, very integral part of our overall offering. I've been very fortunate uh, not to be, and in, in, I know there are 99 other advantages of being a DTC sideholder, but I'm very fortunate to be not a sideholder or borrowing from the bank for decades. And they have the luxury of doing whatever our customer wants, identifying white spaces and offering what they want. But our consumer does want, and this is the first year we see, I personally see from my organization, a cannibalization of mind business by uh, lab-grown business. And right now I feel I'm glad that we started this journey in 2019, and we are also learning a lot. I'm not saying there is no definitive answer and things will evolve, but it's here to stay. Right. And then a, a new view of a, a very innovative uh, downstream, maybe more consumer-facing business with clarity. Um, how are you positioning the product? I know it's, it's kind of a core product for you right now. And then what's the, the, the customer response you're seeing? Sure. I think uh, the direct-to-consumer space is very interesting. Uh, the barriers to entry have never been lower into this space. When I was a child, uh, you typically had to be born into the, the diamond or the colored stone industry. That has materially changed over time. And I think the reason that that's changed is twofold. One is that the supply chain bloat that existed no longer does. Access to India, for example, the largest exporter of diamonds and jewelry, has become easier than ever. The second component of this is technology and understanding the consumer mindset. Generation Z is actually now turning 27, right? That's the first kind of age where you get the mid-90s. Within the next two to five years, a significant percentage of them believe that they will be married, which means that jewelry becomes uh, ever-present in kind of the journey that uh, people take in their lifestyle, especially American consumers. So I think uh, it's, it's very important to understand that with low barriers to entry, you have to be innovative in the way that you speak to them. Um, you have to find the mediums that they want to talk in. Uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned at Barriers to Entry, I spoke to NBC Universal, who's starting a direct, a direct self-service platform for advertising. Uh, they said that, you know, maybe 10 years ago, if you didn't have a $3 million budget to put on a TV ad, forget it, they don't want to talk to you. Today, for $25,000, you can go through Connected TV and talk to any one of these consumers. That's what the world is becoming. It's becoming accessible. I think fragmentation is gonna increase. I think having a true authentic voice to this Generation Z is gonna be more valuable than ever. And the story is gonna have to be woven into the things they care about. Specifically, it's sustainability, environmentalism, climate change, world hunger. All of these things very closely touch our trade and our industry. And we just have to find ways to make sure that we're doing our part to support what they care about. Great, thank you for those insights. Um, maybe moving on to the supply chain transparency, uh, you know, topic. This is something the industry has been kind of kind of working on for years now, and it's it seemed to gain momentum over the last you know year in particular with the sanctions on Russian diamonds and the need to kind of segregate uh, diamonds when we're talking about natural in particular. Um, Sandy, how do you kind of kind of view this? How far into the future do you think it's going to be when we start to see most natural diamonds that are maybe engagement ring size? all come with an origin and, and we can tell the customer where they came from and we can maybe build a story and, and add branded value around that. Um, so from a, I guess from a, from a time frame standpoint, how far away do you think we are to that point? Paul I, Paul, I honestly believe when you talk about larger engagement ring stones, it's happening right now. It's the easiest thing to track and most companies, especially DTC side holders, they have this ledger and this technology has helped them track very easily. I, um, so I believe on the 50 points and above, one carat and above, it, it's already there. Um, any person that you reach out to will be able to pinpoint that where this stone came from and uh, where it was uh, manufactured and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, first of all, I think it's, it's a must to boost the consumer confidence and as we go into the future generation and engage the younger customer, I think this beautiful story needs to be told and people would insist people who are going to be successful are able to, who, the one who control the narrative and are able to actually tell this story. The problem starts, the challenge is with the smalls. And we have limited miners and, you know, we have some um, geopolitical issues and um, the 
the American retailer, there are larger retailers who need the quantum in one quality, in one size, in one style that does amazingly well. And how do you, how do you translate that piece? And how do you tell that story that is uh, a provenance or it came from a Botswana mix or an Al Rosa or, so this is where, so people, I think what we should stress right now is ethical sourcing. Um, transparency in our dealings and we make a considerate choice that if I invest 100, I may not get 110 from my investment, but this is something that is necessary for this business to survive and prosper for, for generations. Like Jamie said, we make it a compelling buy for generations in the past as much as for, I mean, the, the way people have bought in the past, let's make it a compelling buy for the future generations. Yeah, Tejas, I mean, how important do you see this? Is this, the, is this necessary for the survival of natural, especially, I think, when you look at it competing with Lebron? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I think the industry needs to come together, and a lot of work has been done, but it's fragmented. The, re the miners are doing their own bit. Uh, retailers are doing a lot of responsible things, making their vendors uh, do a lot of things, but it's not all aligned. And I think if they come together, the solution would be easier and simpler. Okay. What about uh, you, Anub? I mean, you, um, you're you working, again, direct-to-consumer. Um, how important do you find this is to, to consumers, um, you know, knowing that the origin, and we could, it could be with natural or lab grown. We're seeing it with lab grown now as well. Was it produced in China? Was it produced in the U.S.? Um, so what, what are you saying on this front? Yeah, it's become an absolute minimum requirement, and it, you know, when you realize all the benefits of tracking and tracing, it actually could be a, both an economic value add as well as a consumer value add. Uh, so I, I think that it's, you know, not only was it relevant then, but it's become a requirement now as part of any direct -to consumer business. If you don't know your own supply chain or where your product is sourcing or coming from, it's very hard to then show a consumer why that they should be uh, living in your brand ethos or in your product ethos. Great. And then, well, Mish, I mean, I think we're talking about, you know, transparency and being able to show the origin of a, of a diamond. We're going to probably see that on a, on a grading a GIA cert. Um, with lab grown, how important is, is grading, I think, as we get into the future and the qualities, you know, become higher, um, you know, with, with, with the technologies improving. And I, I guess, how do you see, um, you know, origin of a, a lab grown, you know, you know, playing a role in all of this? See, today's consumer is socially, environmentally, and economically responsible. So when we talk about provenance, when we talk about climate, all of these, these are no longer an optional conversation. It's a part of who the lab-grown industry needs to be. Uh, from a traceability perspective, this is an absolute requirement. It's no longer optional. Uh, from growing, cutting, polishing, designing and then finally bringing it to the retailer or if you're directly distributing, it is an absolute, it's possible and it's an absolute requirement because technology today is aiding that, you know, when we talk of larger diamonds in the mind, it's become much easier. In the smaller diamonds and, uh, you know, as we know, luxury brands are stepping into the category, especially in the lab run category and we deal with them. And the absolute requirements, be it a one-pointer, they need traceability. They need to make sure that the diamonds are either grown with renewable energy and or offsets. Offsets is anyway looked down, but with a carbon reduction plan. They want to make sure that the facilities where these diamonds are being cut, polished, are approved for quality of basically the social responsibility part has been taken care of. And then further, when you're doing jewelry, you know, the gold conversation, which nobody really talks about, is a very important conversation, you know, as jewelers. So in the lab grown category, I see this as the most amazing opportunity for the industry. I think we have to pick up exactly where the lab grown, uh, the earth mine industry has brought it and almost turbo it because what the lab grown industry can do in 12 months and I'm working with either growers, the energy guys, the tracing companies. What we can do in 12 months, it will take at least three years for the earth mine category to get there. And it's not that they can't do it, it's just the challenges they have as an established category. So I think for brands that are direct to consumer, for boutique brands, or for larger retailers, this I believe in the next 12 months, if a retailer says, I will no longer take supply unless you can show origin, I would tell the community, do not be surprised. 
Good. Thank you for that insight there. Um, I guess we'll get to the, fi the final point here, branding at a, at a product level. Tejas, kind of curious what, what your thoughts are here. Um, you know, we're seeing this continue to be, you know, such a fast-growing area. How hard is it to, to build a brand that consumers really, you know, are loyal towards and, and want to associate with? So, uh, you know, as we saw in the presentations, India's a powerhouse when it comes to uh, the amount of polish it gives. And you wonder why there are no uh, companies that are aligned with this on the branding and the retail perspective. And... Uh, I think, Jamie, you would agree that it takes a lot of patience to build a retail business and a brand, right? So, and Indians traditionally have been transaction-driven. They need to make money on every trade, and that needs to change. Uh, and if it does, I think we'll see uh, a lot of Indian brands uh, come up and do that. Well, yeah, Sandy, please. Sort of, no. Brand is not my subject, so I'm not going to. But I just want to go back to. I'm going to go back to the earlier point, okay. and I'm not trying to endorse RJC here. But we are members of seven years, so when I make this statement, I want to make this disclaimer. I think all of us should make that choice to to start there to become part of RJC members. It is intimidating, but when you go through that 50 steps, most companies are observing 45 of them, and the five that they are not are pretty easily manageable to overcome. I'm giving you a smallest example. I should have a fire extinguisher in my office or put a yellow tape on top of the walk-in wall that I have so that people don't fall. I mean, there are some minor, some little bit major to overcome, but I think that would be the great step towards achieving um, A, ethical sourcing eventually to Amish's point, to provenance, to, to when a retailer makes it a must, that would be a great start. There would be some challenges that can be worked out, but even if we can achieve 50, 70, 80 percent of uh, the way we work and ensure a consumer what we are delivering to them, I think it would be a great win for the industry, yeah. diamond and jewelry industry. Yeah. Very good, very good point there. Anub, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the branding yeah. uh, topic? I think they just you hit it on the head. Um, so traditionally, American businesses have benefited from low cost of capital, where Indian businesses had very heavy uh, weighted average cost of capital and believed in very asset heavy models. So the idea was, why tell a story when you can buy a product? Given that the shelf life of uh, gold and commodity driven products is so high, it ultimately became a, a, a no loss proposition where you could inevitably liquidate and recover a majority of that cost. Therefore, people in that trade traditionally tended to not build brands, but build products or product services. And I think that that is something that you know, we all sort of have to become attuned to. The lab created diamond actually is, uh, given that the downward pressure on price over time has happened so fast, it's made us all a little bit more brand conscious. It's made us all realize that we do have shelf life to our product, and therefore potentially we do need to innovate in order to you know, sustain our margins and to do other things that allow our businesses to thrive. So brand is more important than ever today, and I think the disruption to the product part of the industry is proving that. I think uh, when I look at the 75 years of the Indian history, you know, the first, when you look at, like, you know, the first two, three quarters, and then you look at each uh, 25 years, I think we evolved as a component manufacturer. You know, diamonds used to come in through various Burma and that, and I think some of the seniors might know that the core, I remember from my granddad's time, that the rough used to enter from Burma into India, and Kolkata was the core hub of diamonds, uh, consumed in India, and Israel was a key cutting center. But when you look at evolution from there, in the 70s was when India started manufacturing. You know, the manufacturing firms in India started establishing, we started learning to cut. Uh, evolution from purely the hand cutting to where in the 90s, where you see the paramedic machines get into this conversation, and that moves ahead. Then was the birth of seeps, which is uh, the jewelry category. Uh, the jewelry category in the earlier days, uh, like Harani said, the Indians were primarily a supporter or service. They used to service loose diamonds, either sell it to a New York wholesaler, and they saw a value addition in jewelry. Uh, these factories that established in the late, I remember in 87, 88, one of the first factories in Seeps was established. It was doing electroforming. 
that, uh, and from electroforming, uh, I remember myself going into seeps from 91 and starting to work in when the first vac setting machines, actually the units were imported. So that was that entire decade was Indians learning jewelry. So, you know, when you look at the entire supply chain, so we have now learned how to cut diamonds. We're getting better at that. Then we learned how to make jewelry, but we were still very far from where the consumer is. Uh, India was considered a low cost uh, center. And I think India had the benefit and I think every senior person in this room took the best benefit of that, built the strongest companies, and serviced the retailers. When you look at the next phase, which is the early 2000s, uh, you know, margin, margins in business always force you to innovate. And while we were starting to get better in jewelry, Evolution pushed it to start moving to better in jewelry. The offices in New York between the late 90s and the early 2000s, uh, Indian, houses from India opened offices. And then now they're working directly with the retailers and the New York wholesalers started moving out and Israel was almost losing most of its manufacturing. India moved to almost 92% diamond cutting. Seeps became the core hub. If you were a large retailer, Light Signet or any other large player, be it an e-com or as such, you were associated with the manufacturer moved to 2010 to 2020, while, and this is something I'd said in one of the panels, I think what you have to see is as a manufacturer, you keep innovating yourself, hoping to improve your margins or sustain them. And this leads and forces you to keep moving ahead. By then, you have now the third generation entering in the space that is far more educated, in Western countries, and learning and understanding the global trade. Uh, Today, as you see, you know, uh, brands like what Anub is building and so many brands that have rooted in from the Indian jewelry families are starting to come out and you'll see in their early phases of the first five years. This is bound to grow. And I believe that it is important uh, because the two centers of margin, and I know this is more business, but yes, the two centers of margin are producer, grower, or the retailer. The midstream, according to Bain, if you look at it, the last two decades, we have a, almost a 0.5% negative value addition to the category. So realistically, if you're looking to add value, you have to enter this space. So this is like the underlying conversation, according to me, why that aspirational part is gonna come, why Anub and the younger entrepreneurs are doing. Lab-grown diamonds coming to the category further fires this up because now, you do not, you're not attached to a controlled supply chain. Now, the digital world is saying, you know what? You do not have to be a major investor. You don't need a big company. You can, if you know how to talk to the consumer, welcome to the party. And if you take these two things and you bring in, use the expertise of the Indian jewelry manufacturers in India, and India right now, when you look at large diamonds, anything over one carat plus, in the lab-grown segment, especially in the CBD, because it's almost 99% CBD, is controlling almost 85% of the global supply. So you're looking at every single component coming from home base. You have the entrepreneurs that are ready to talk to the consumer. So I think in the next decade, uh, I think the way I would see it is, it's not about where we are today. I think in the next decade, if you said 10 years from today, you would see Indian brands having a strong conversation, be it Europe, Australia, Americas, with the consumer, and building value-based prepositions. You know, we all aspire, we look at the Tiffany's and that, that have 100-year-old stories, and, you know, they are great aspirations, but everything that happened in 100 years is now probably going to happen in 25 and 10, if you know how to make it. So that's my <laughs> thought process. Yeah, well, well said. Uh, maybe I'm getting to the, the final uh, topic here. I think we're running out of time. But Sandy, you and I were, were kind of talking about um, 2021. It was a, a record year for the industry for everybody. Everybody probably can ex explain why it was such a good year. Everybody has their own story. Um, but looking forward, how do you think the industry can build on, on that momentum? Um, you know, kind of closing out 2022, uh, looking to 2023, 2024, given the, the, the uncertain macroeconomic backdrop. And I guess we can speak maybe to the U.S. market in particular, since I know that's kind of where you're focused. The good news is that, you know, in 2021, the, every single stakeholder in the diamond and jewelry industry benefited, you know, irrespective of 
what end of the trade you were part of. Uh, people had a good year and we all know the reasons you and me can sit down and uh, write down 20 reasons for it. And some of those are the same reasons why we are seeing a slowdown right now, especially in the second half, you know, between the geographical, geopolitical uh, situation and the stimulus money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on a continuous basis to maintain the momentum, I believe there are two choices. One that we've been talked about for last decade is, you know, minus taking a percentage of um, the cost of the rough at the primary level, add it and mark that money in a, in a device a plan, how to market diamond and jewelry, every category of diamond and jewelry industry across the world based on the proportion. And I'm sure there are smart people who can figure that out. That would be a great start. And again, um, all of us in a conscious way between product innovations to engaging youth to consistent and relentless marketing and telling some beautiful stories about, uh, you know, how and how the diamonds are made, how the jewelry is manufactured, the, the the people who manufacture their stories, and bringing some beautiful products, and uh, that would be two ways that I would suggest that we keep the momentum going on a long-term basis and keep uh, the consumer engaged to buy this beautiful category on an ongoing basis. Uh, Tejas, what are your, what's your kind of prediction here? Um, I think, you know, 2022, you know, there are speculation that we could have a year that's comparable to 2021. I think a lot of that's because of 8% inflation. So on a nominal basis, it looks better than it does on a real basis. But as far as just, you know, trend momentum going into 2023, what are your, what are your kind of thoughts? So if we keep everything status quo, we're going to have a tough time, right? Uh, so as Sandeep said, it's, it's marketing, bringing the customer in, uh, having innovation where... You know, it's, it's a pull for the customer. The wallet and the money is limited. You've got to fight for the category. If you're better than the rest, uh, I think we'll have a good year. I, I wanted to go back to your brand, just put one thought uh, in there. Uh, we as Indians, uh, we polish 90% of the world's diamonds and we're thrilled about it and we celebrate that, which is great. Uh, but the retail industry is 200 billion. So I wonder why we just keep looking at the 25 billion, right? I think there's 90% still to to go for. I, I think uh, guys like Anu, I think so, are heading in the right direction. And, uh, I think there's something to think about. I just wanted to add one thought to this is just generally, you know, as we understand, I think one important statistic I found was about 200,000 Indian students are in the United States at any given time. Um, and they contribute about $8 billion annually to the United States. Now, we need to do more to take that because of what they do, how well educated they are, who they are. We need to find ways to keep them here. How do we get them to contribute their ideas? They have ties back to India. They understand our manufacturing prowess, our technology prowess. So, you know, what we can do to increase, you know, accessibility to uh, visas, other things, goes a very long way in terms of acquiring, procuring, and keeping that talent here. I think everybody's uh, getting hungry, but anybody have any final, final thoughts here? Or is there we have another 15 minutes. There you go. Okay, I got yeah. 15 minutes. Great. Well, let's, um, this is a diplomatic uh, event, right? Um, what, what would you like to see you know, the governments, the American government, and the Indian government do to maybe support you know, you know, our, our businesses? I think you know, just within the last few weeks we saw the Indian government is, is doing things to incentivize uh, labor and diamond industry with subsidies on, on energy and, and financing of capital equipment. Um, are these the sort of things that you think we need to be seeing in the industry right now? Yes, I think uh, I'm going to be bold to ask and say it. Uh, when we look at the fine jewelry industry, again, look at the last two decades, one of the big points of growth was the early 2000s, and most people here in the room will remember uh, when the tariff was taken off. When the tariff was taken off, there was a multifold growth between the trade between India and U.S. Not only that, when you take the inflation number that you're sitting today and you actually take the tariff out, keep a very small part of it and you pass it to the consumer, you're going to have a dual impact. So I think that is the one big conversation which I'm in no position to have with the governments, but the governments are very much in a position to have with each other that how do you take the advantage 
of the largest manufacturing base in the world with the largest consumer in place. The second one is look at how fast and aggressively India is moving towards an energy conscious uh, country. You know, uh, today we've reached 100% renewable for every diamond we grow. We've gone scope one, scope two with carbon, and many companies are making as aggressive of a move to be there. When you look at that, look at the state of Gujarat, and I don't even know, because most of us are from there, and I believe that most of them don't know. Did you know that 27% of energy used in the state of Gujarat actually comes from renewable sources? And they are pushing that further. So when you look at the American consumer, who's environmentally conscious, you know, you buy anything, you from, go from a pair of socks to yesterday in the Women's Wear Daily, and I landed and I, late night, and I, was, I got an article in about where the carpet's going next year, and it was about the conversation of Oscars 23, and it's a sustainable dress. And somebody had reached out, uh, messaged me, he's like, well, we should have a piece of jewelry that represents and should be worn for this dress. So I said, okay, let's catch up. But that's where it's heading. So if the two countries get together and say, wait a second, you're going faster after exactly what we need, and we will give you a tariff break, and this is where I'm gonna make a bold <laughs> ask, is if the US and Indian government work together to put a tariff break for diamonds and fine jewelry imported into the United States and or <laughs> India from, that are manufactured by the other country, that are either carbon neutral, made with recycled components, and or with energy efficiency, I think it would be fantastic. You know, you go buy an electric car, you get a rebate. You wanna put solar panels, like just Google solar, and the companies in New York will be after you, you don't have to pay anything. So why not the jewelry industry? This is an amazing opportunity. And yes, we're a small industry, we're smaller than the pet industry. But even as a small industry, we have the ability to make a movement. Means, you know, they say a ship takes a lot to turn. So in all the bigger ships, if you look at the jewelry industry, we're like a speedboat. That if the governments get together and say that will reduce the tariff, forget taking away because otherwise they'll say, okay, the budgets don't match. We'll reduce the tariffs. But then think of how much you're gonna increase the imports and improve the geopolitical relationship within the country. So that's how I look in here. Help the business to help the country and help the consumer. Anybody else have any thoughts that you'd like to add? <laughs> uh, I just uh, want to share something that recently uh, UAE removed a 5% import duty to Amish's point uh, to import gold from India. And India reciprocated by <coughs> reducing half a percent duty from gold imported from UAE. You know, India, if I'm not mistaken, is the second largest consumer of uh, gold in the world. And that half a percent to the Indians means so much in terms of dollars and cents. It is not quantifiable. It is quantifiable, it is big. Um, and now India is working with Australia, UK, and many other countries for such bilateral treaties, two largest democracies in the world. <coughs> with the recent geopolitical situation with what's happening in the rest of the world and some of the nations are not preferred nations anymore. Forget about sanctioned nations. These are the two countries who can sit, resolve their differences. It's easy for me to say remove the traffic, I mean tariff on, the due, uh, on jewelry, but whatever it is, you know, give and take, do something, do some reciprocative uh, action, take some reciprocative actions and it would be good. In the end, the consumer would benefit. And the business would definitely grow from where it is today. So, good point, Amish. You know, I agree. A number of ways I wanted to it. add something interesting. Uh, the UAE has also removed the tariff on lab ground diamonds. A tariff that was specifically pushed by the stalwarts, which is in different countries. Actually, that tariff just got, because we had been working there, uh, South Korea, a lot of places, these tariffs are now removed. So, if you look at that whole conglomerate, about 15 countries, so gold, and uh, diamonds, and with UAE also as of 23, is going into a very uh, strong gold traceability program. Because as I uh, constantly speak with Ahmed, and their gold traceability program kicks in, and it's surprising to me, as if you look at all, everybody that's sitting in the room, you know, we control most of the gold that flows into the industry. So, 
That is where you can have a multifold impact, support the industry, help the geopolitical, and ultimately climate change, which is one of the biggest conversations out there. You can be a flag bearer as an industry, even if you're one of, it's like we're the largest small industry that the governments can use to talk. That half a percent has certainly made UAE the preferred importer of gold in, the, in yeah. India right now. encourage two things. One is investment capital going towards startups. The innovation and ideas that come from new and uh, non-legacy businesses will go a very long way for this industry as it has for the tech industry. Uh, the second area I would encourage is um, uh, you know, we, we tend to be a manufacturing heavy industry, which means that we hire a certain level of skill for labor. But now with, you know, the advancements in education and the younger generation, you know, not everyone is going to become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever be the case or financier. We can bring a lot of that talent into the jewelry industry. And it's very important to encourage kind of this generation that's coming forward to see what innovations they can bring on the business side here. Uh, I think one really important thought was there was a very um, interesting business school class and uh, you know the professor sort of said look around you know not all of you are going to make it and everyone was confused and it was well because you all are competing for that same investment banking job. The reality is is though you will succeed the best when you take your education and apply it to more traditional industries such as the jewelry business and be able to take it forward and become a pioneer and an innovator. Um, I think all of us have had, most of us have had a, a long, to say it very but humbly, a rewarding journey in this industry. The industry has been good to all of us. I think time has come where we make some conscious choices which are not necessarily financially rewarding, but very essential for the future, the growth, success, relevance, importance of our industry. Uh, not just in USA, but everywhere. And I think collectively, individually and collectively, these measures would really put our industry into uh, limelight and, and a product that we will deliver will be a desired product for the right reasons. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> Anybody left? Last chance here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, I think in simple words, I would say that uh, if I speak on behalf uh, of the category I think we're sitting with an amazing opportunity. I think, uh, just like what Sandeepai was just saying, look at what, what can we do, what can we give back? And uh, I think the climate conversation, which is one of the biggest conversations, if this industry can take the necessary steps, uh, which is actually possible, it would completely change the conversation at the consumer front. So that's the first part. And the second part is, I think, growing up in the business, we were always dependent on somebody talking on our behalf to the consumer, mm -hmm. you know, which is the producers and that. I think it's better to work, start focusing on building brands uh, and or work with your retailers that are talking to the <laughs> consumers and start creating stories. Because especially when I look at the lab grown industry, I think, you know, there's this conversation about pricing and that. I think the conversation of pricing is an absence of value. And this is what, as an industry, because we come from a component background. You buy it for a dollar, you add value, you sell it for a dollar ten. So it's always been price driven. But the moment you put the price away, 
and you say, okay, what can I do? It's like I'd seen in, uh, this thing on Instagram and it caught me and I love it. It says, you're focusing too much on the product. Start thinking about how you can create value and it's important as manufacturers, growers, jewelry manufacturers, and partners to retailers that we need to start looking outside. Like, you know, I draw usually a ring. This is the product. If this had no value, what do I do and how big can I draw a circle of value? And I think as an industry, if we transition into that direction, it takes time. But as we transition into the, this direction, we will see value, we'll see investors, and we'll see people giving far more respect to this industry than we currently have. So that's what happens. Good point. Okay, good, good. Is that the final thought? Okay, well, um, thank you for this fantastic panel. Very interesting conversation indeed. So let's give everybody a round of applause. Thank you so much to our panelists and our moderator. I think what I learned from all of this is sky is the limit for this industry. So I wish you all the very, very, very best as you take our name forward. Um, I would actually like to request Paul, um, Amish, and Anoop to just stay on the stage if that is okay. And I'd also like to call upon the stage Mr. Rajiv Pandya to present them some awards. With Paul. Uh, for Paul, can I also call on the stage Manoj Bandari? The Indian Diamond and Color Stone Association. This token of appreciation presented to Paul Zeminski, diamond industry analyst and consultant, the moderator for the IDCA U.S. Jewelry Industry Symposium panel, IDCA. Huge round of applause, everyone. Let's hear it for our moderator. Thank you. To honor Mr. Amish Shah, may I please call upon the stage Anshul Shah? Indian Diamond and Colorstone Association, this token of appreciation is presented to Mr. Amish Shah, President, Alter Created Diamonds, Panelist, IDCA U.S. Jewelry Industry Symposium, IDCA. And to present the award to Anup Shah, may I please call upon the stage of Lee Chordia. The Indian Diamond and Color Stone Association, this token of appreciation is presented to Anup Shah, Chief Executive Officer with Clarity, Inc., panelist IDCA Jewelry Industry Symposium, IDCA. Thank you, everyone. It was such an honor to be your MC for the event today. This trade symposium, I believe, is way more than just, um, you know, all of us gathering. I think today we learned a lot about the industry and we learned from a lot of intellectual individuals. So it's been amazing. So a huge round of applause for all of you for being here today with us. And I 